Okay, are we all organized? Is the microphone working and all the rest of it? And hang on. Right. Okay, hello everybody. So this is round three. This is the third part of my Active Matter lectures. And what I want to do today is to follow on and actually use what we were doing yesterday to look at two problems. The first one is the hair and the tortoise problem, and then the second one is actually looking at eukaryotic cells, squishy cells, and how they move. And we've ended up thinking about these things really quite recently. I've been learning all this biophysics quite recently because what I would like to what I would like to do is um, show you that the ideas of topological defects seem to be coming out in the biological systems. This is much closer to a research seminar. Um, some of this work is, actually all, almost all of this work is unpublished. Um, and so it's less organized than I hope the rest of the talk was because they're things we don't understand yet. Okay, so questions are very welcome because we're still trying to find the right questions to, to ask. So the first thing is this, um, let me just remind you what we're on about. Remember, this is the picture we had last time. We have topological defects in these active systems, plus and minus a half topological defects are created in pairs, they move around, and then they destroyed in pairs, so you end up with something like a gas of topological defects. And the defects are self-motile. You can look at the flow fields around them. So what has this now got to do with this, my hair and the tortoise story? Now, does this work in Brazil? Do people from different countries know what I'm on about when I talk about the hair and the tortoise? Yeah? I was actually living in Copenhagen in the uh, house where Hans Christian Andersen possibly wrote. I hope I've got the right, the right guy, actually. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a fable. It's a very famous fable. And, it, and it's very relevant to, to, to what I'm going to talk about. And, and the work has been done in collaboration with these people, and in particular, Armin, who is now actually at the Niels Bohr Institute in the, as an assistant professor, has been in Oxford for about five years, and we miss him a lot. He's wonderful. And then Oli, despite the picture, is a, an absolutely amazing uh, <laughs> experimental graduate student who's been responsible for all the uh, experiments. And then uh, Mac Durham and Kevin Foster have been supervising the experiments and trying to explain to me about the biology behind all this. So, we're thinking bacteria now. These are twitching bacteria. The reason they're different from what we've talked about so far is that up to now we've had things which swim through a fluid. These guys crawl on the surface. So they have pili, tiny sort of feelers, which pull them across the surface. And they actually twitch, which means they tend to go forwards and backwards, so they change direction every now and then. And you can sort of see them twitching there. And you can see that they're pneumatic. Yeah, they're long and thin. Although all this stuff about pneumatic flow fields probably doesn't work because these things are on the surface. They're not swimming. And um, you can see pneumatic order locally, okay? Locally, they tend to line up. That makes sense because it's easier for them to fit together. But globally, there isn't pneumatic order. Now, our colleagues in zoology at Oxford are interested in what happens when you have mixtures of different sorts of bacteria. This is a big deal at the moment because people are realizing that um, health in your stomach depends on the sort of bacteria you have in the stomach, and it's a very fine balance between about 100 different species of these things. We can't do 100 different ones, so what they did is they tried to mix together two different sorts of bacteria to see how they interacted with each other. And the two sorts they mi 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 mixed together 
are these, which are the wild-type pseudomonas. So they've got these little twitchy things which pull them around. And then they genetically modified them to give hyperpileated pseudomonas, ones with more feelers. And so, as you might expect, these guys move faster because they've got more feet to pull themselves around. Okay, so we've got the wild type, which is slow, and the hyperpileated ones, which are faster. This is a PDF, a probability distribution, showing the speeds of these things. So this is uh, the number with a given speed. The wild type are the blue ones, and the hyperpileated ones are the brown ones. And you can see there's a wide spread, but the ones with more feet, on average, move faster. The mean of the distribution is moved in this direction. WT means wild type. It took me a while to realize what wild type meant. I thought, you know, people were out there with the ponds and their fishing rods trying to get these things out of ponds. And it's sort of like that. Wild type just means ones you haven't mucked around with. And then delta pill H is just what we call the ones which have these more, uh, more feet. Okay, so then we've got a reservoir here of the different sorts of bacteria. And because they move, more because they move than because they divide for these things, because they move, they're going to spread out from this colony back here. The top line is the wild type ones, which are slow. The one in the middle is the um, ones with lots of feet, which are meant to be fast. And then down here, they're ones where they've taken all the feelers off, so they're not going to go anywhere, Okay, just as a control. So let's see what happens. Let's see how quickly these things spread. OK. So that's weird, yeah? That's very strange. The ones which are meant to move individually more slowly at the top do to start with, but then they catch up and they overtake the fast ones. That's why we called it the hare and the tortoise. OK, remember the tortoise wins in the end. These lines are just where you had to, they had to move the microscope stage to keep up with the bacteria. They're not important, and I assume they didn't cheat. Okay? And these guys are the ones which don't go anywhere because they basically haven't got any, <coughs> any feelers. Oh, gosh, panic, panic, coughing. <laughs> I think I feel all right, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's just too much talking. Okay, so... Something is going on. We have to understand what's going on here. And it turns out that we can explain this in terms of topological defects, which is surprising. This is just a graph showing what I just showed you um, pictorially. All right, this is the radius of the colony as a function of time, the position of the leading edge of the colony, I should say, as a function of time, these black ones are the slow wild type ones. They start off slower, but then they cross over and become quicker. These yellow ones are the genetically modified ones with more feet, which are meant to be faster, but eventually spread slower. That's, that's strange. We need to explain what's going on. So let's look at now a mixture, and let's look at the front of the colony for a mixture of these bacteria. And you can see that to start with, you definitely get the yellow ones. The yellow ones are the fast ones, and you get more yellow ones at the edge of the colony. But at later times, the slow ones are taking over. The slow ones are getting further. So that's saying, again, the same thing in a slightly different way. Right, so has everyone got the question? Any questions? Yeah? No, and that's a very good question. They are growing slowly compared to this. So we should think of this in terms of, indeed, 
Um, that's what it says there, not a growth defect. Okay? They do divide a bit, but the majority is just that they're spreading out because they're moving. And, it, and certainly the first guess would be, okay, so the, the wild type ones are, are, are dividing faster, but that's not the case. The rate of division is very similar and it's small. Yeah? I'm not sure correlation length is the right thing to measure here. Um, certainly not at the, the front, all right? In the bulk, you could perhaps do that. And yes, we did. And I'll show you some results there. OK. Oh, right. It's, it's, it's near the end of the school, so we're allowed jokes. All right, this, is, this says I shouldn't be showing this. Because, because it's probably, uh, yeah, anyway. OK, so now let's think about topological defects in these systems. Certainly, if we've got something which looks locally nematic, we can, we can look for patterns which are either a plus a half-like defect or a minus a half-like defect. And this shows the defects. The defects, the red ones are the plus or halves, and the arrows are the direction they're moving in. Um, the blue ones are the minus or halves. They're not quite real topological defects, because strictly you're meant to have a complete pneumatic everywhere. And this is cheating a bit, because it's only locally pneumatic, but you can still define them. You can still look for these patterns. And we know about them, because I... We've done this before, right? We've done a continuum theory. We've found the defects. These are the same sort of plus and minus topological defects. They seem to be behaving in the same way. But, but maybe this isn't a terribly good theory for these rod-like things. A much more obvious way to do a computer simulation for them is just to have a load of rods, which look like bacteria, and to have them move around and to do the very simplest thing, what we did is we took hard rods, so they can't overlap with each other, and then they're moved by just a constant driving force. So the force is just moving them constantly. So they're active rods, that force is providing the activity. So if you just run that simulation, these rods in two dimensions, you get something which looks very, very like the bacteria. And in particular, you can identify topological defects, these plus and minus a half topological defects. Now, if I were you, at this point, I would say, who's she kidding, right? Why, are, why am I saying that the defects in this, um, these loads of bacteria and in the two different models, very different models. I mean, why am I allowed to say they're really the same thing? And the answer is I'm, I'm not sure I am still, but we did look at the flow fields around these defects. We looked at uh, the velocity fields around the defects. And when I talk about the velocity fields in a model like this, I mean the average velocity around the defects, so the average velocity of the surrounding rods. So it's like sort of coarse graining it. And this is what you get. Remember, we sort of had pictures like these yesterday. This is the minus a half defect. And you can see the very obvious six-fold flow symmetry. This is a plus a half defect. And you get these two vortices, exactly like we saw yesterday, because this is from the continuum simulations. If you look at the rod model, you see exactly, well, pretty much the same thing. It's more noisy because it's a stochastic model, but you get the six um, vortices there and the two vortices here. And you can see the sort of length scale relative to the, the cell. And then these are the experiments. Again, you're getting the same pattern. You can see the six vortices, although, that, again, the noise is much bigger in the experimental system. And down here, you're seeing the two vortices. So um, so that's why I think these things are behaving in a very similar way in the different systems. 
that they're producing the same local flow fields around the topological defects. That's why I think it's reasonable to say that we could perhaps use the same physics in all those different um, places. Okay, so that was sort of the next bit, that these things are topological defects. So now I want to put them together. I want to try and understand why this hair and the tortoise business around the, um, around the, 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 the spreading bacteria, the fact that the slow ones spread faster, has anything to do with topological defects. So I'll tell you the answer, okay? It took us a while to sort out the answer. You can sort of see it here. This is looking at a mixture of these things from the top, and you can see clumps forming. Okay? This is actually uh, two different sorts of imaging, so you're seeing it through twice with different images, and you can see obvious clumps forming there. And then we start again, and you can see the clumps forming. What those clumps are is regions where the bacteria have got stuck. They get stuck, and then they point upwards away from the surface. So they're, they're wriggling around like this, and then suddenly they form clumps where they're verticalized, you'd say, in America, but I don't like that word, but that's what's happening, okay? They're sticking upwards. And then they get stuck sticking upwards, and other bacteria come and join them. And so um, you, you, you get these immobile bacteria stuck in regions where they're pointing upwards away from the surface. It turns out that the fast ones get stuck in these clumps much more than the slow ones. And the way the clumps form is due to topological defects. What happens, and I mean, I will I'm going to show you the simulations first and then the experiments, because we have seen this experimentally, but it's a bit hard to see. Yeah? What happens is that two of these plus a half defects come close to each other, rumpf, you know, they're moving, so they move like this, and they start to circle around each other. And what happens is that you get locally a pair of plus a half defects which looks like a plus one defect. The two plus a halves join together and transiently form a plus one. And it's known that plus one defects are unstable in these systems and that if you get a plus one defect, what happens is that things prefer to sort of escape from the defect and point upwards. So what happens is at places like this where two plus a halves come together, everything flips so that it's pointing upwards. Let's have a look at the pictures. Two defects are coming towards each other, two plus a halves. That's the orange arrows. And these blue ones are the minus a halves, which have to hang around because um, you, you can't have plus a halves without minus a halves with them. And if they approach each other slowly, they push things up but then they fall back down again. They haven't got enough energy to stay upright. If they approach each other quickly, what happens is they much more easily form these verticalized colonies. And, I mean, we can't, eventually those are going to get, go down, but that's just because of the finite size of the simulation. Here are... Here are bigger simulations. These are these rod simulations. Here's for slow bacteria. Here's for medium speed bacteria. And here's for fast ones. Slow ones, medium, fast. Let's look at the difference. You see the slow ones, nothing much happens. Here you get these local colonies. Here, the verticalized bits where things are stuck and can't move anymore form much, much more easily. So what's happening is that um, the fast bacteria tend to form topological defects which move quickly, which form these vertical colonies. The slow ones don't form the vertical colonies because their topological defects aren't moving fast enough. And so all the fast ones get stuck in these vertical portions 
leaving the slow ones behind to spread out. This shows it actually happening. Okay, this is much, these are really clever experiments to actually get this moment where the bacteria stick up, but they don't look incredibly amazing, um, but they are really, they're much more amazing than the simulations, but they're not such nice colors. Okay, so this is a point here, we're going to get a point here, we call them, um, you have to wait, if I get this right, yeah, there we go. So here, two defects come together, and here you're getting one of these clusters forming. Looking down on it, this is this verticalized cluster forming in the middle, and you can see it's yellow, and yellow is the stain for the fast bacteria. So it's the fast ones which form here, and looking down with a different sort of microscope, you can see, well, looking from the side, right, everybody sort of looks like this, okay? you can see that things stick out here. This is the verticalized cluster forming, and it's the yellow bacteria, the fast ones, that get stuck. So just to finish that off, here's a mixture of two sorts of bacteria, because we wanted to see if we had a mixture, does it still work? So this is a simulation with a mixture, and you can see the clusters forming, and then we can count the number of fast ones that get stuck in the cluster and the number of slow ones that get stuck in the clusters. Visually, it's quite hard to see that you get mostly yellow here. I think you can sort of just about see it, but we actually did the counting, and it is the fast ones that get stuck in these clusters. So what happens is... Um, yeah, this is the velocity... The velocity goes up and up. Here, the clusters start forming. So this is the number in the cluster. The clusters start forming. And when they start forming, the velocity goes down because you're taking out the fast bacteria. So what the zoologists say is that bacteria have organized themselves, they've evolved to have a certain speed. The wild type have a certain speed. They tend to be fast enough to move, but not so fast that they get stuck in these clusters. And if you made them faster, which you might think was better for them, it turns out not to be because they get stuck and they can't spread. So this is the conclusion, and it's these topological defects which nucleate the clusters. So topological defects here have um, a biological role to play. Okay, so that's my first story. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah? Uh, so those bacteria don't have uh, adhesion proteins that bind them together? No, no, it's not like cells. They to a good approximation independence, although the biologists worry a bit whether that could have an effect. Yeah. Once they've formed the clusters, then they start making extracellular matrix and sort of get stuck and start forming a biofilm. But that comes later. And about the potential you use, it's short ranges? Sorry, sorry, again. The potential, your cow potential that you use on simulation, it's short ranges? Short range. Yeah. Fairly steep short range potential. So no overlaps is what we're after. Yeah, good. Other questions? Okay. So let's look at the movie. Oops. We're going to move movie. Um, oh, no. I thought I checked all these. Yeah, there we go. We're moving, yes. Okay. <laughs> so I'd rather if you clap the science than the movies, really, but never mind. Yeah.
Okay, so that's my first story. We're now completely switching to a different system, and we're looking at eukaryotic cells. Eukaryotic cells are the squishy ones that you get in your body. Okay, so this is the picture. This is a two-dimensional layer of cells, like the ones that line the lungs or the stomach. Okay, and if you look at the dynamics, it looks a bit like active turbulence. So our question was, is this active turbulence? Is there anything the same or not? And can we say anything useful about it? And that's really evolved into a, into a question, how do I best model a system like this? What are the important forces? I think we can model them using these continuum models, but there's an awful lot we're missing there because we can't see the individual cells. So let's start with the story of how do these cells move? Okay, if you put them on a Petri dish, if you just have individual cells, what's going to happen is they all sort of move around on their own. And the forces, that, the sort of internal mechanism that's doing that for you is the green stuff. So this is looking from the top. This is an actin network. So actin filaments are formed, and the actin... Um, treadmills, so it pushes the front of the cell forward. So you've got actin pushing forwards. If that's all you have, it's going to leave its back end behind. And so you have actin at the back of the cell, which is acted on by molecular motors, which tend to contract the network. And so it sort of brings its tail back. So it's pushing forward and bringing in its tail. And so people always say that um, cell motion is contractile. What that means is you know, its tail end cat, cat, catches up. In order to do this, it has to push against something. What it pushes against is the surface, and it does that by forming these sort of little things called focal adhesions with the surface. And so the focal adhesion forms under the front of the cell, um, and then the cell pulls on it and pulls itself forwards. That's the physicist view. Let's have a look at the movie of seeing one of these things actually moving. And, and people are, are doing, this, this is moving actually in 3D. And it, and, and, and it compares the, the, the movie, um, which was taken 20 years ago, with what they can do now. OK? This is the cell moving through the, the, the extracellular matrix, the matrix between the tissues. And you can see that it's a pretty complicated object. And you can see it doesn't really look very much like my explanation. And that's really because my explanation was for cells which are moving in two dimensions on a Petri dish, whereas this is moving in three dimensions through this extracellular matrix. And in fact, most of the experiments are in 2D, but obviously most of the reality is in 3D, and we do have a lot to understand still about, about cells moving in 3D, but that's a different story. Okay, so that's how individual cells move. They sort of just pull themselves around, and if we're physicists, right, we have a cell and there's a force on it. That's how you probably would, would model it. The very simplest model would just be a cell sitting there with a force acting on it. Quite how you put in that force, would you have a random walk, we'll, we'll think about a bit in, in, in a moment. Now, if you take these cells and you put them together, so they form one of these epithelial layers, there's a thing called contact in inhibition of locomotion, which means different things to different people. It's not entirely clear in the literature what it means, but I think probably a good working definition is that if you put cells together, they stop forming lamellopodia. They, they stop trying to move in a given direction and they just sort of sit there. And so the only forces acting on them probably are the intercellular forces, the forces due to the cell junctions. Okay? The cells look like they stop trying to go anywhere, but they're still moving, so there must be some forces somewhere, and those forces are, are, are probably due to the junctions between the cells. Ah, oh, so they are moving. Okay. 
Right, so this is a thank you to people who've, who've uh, worked on this. I must say that one of the nice things about being a physicist is that you work with people from all over the world. Um, and one of the rather nasty things about this virus is that different countries are seem, uh, seem to be sort of, you know, looking out for their own country rather than for everyone. So I'm very proud that our minister from Iran and Marana, Sumesh and Sridharth are from India, Guanming is from China, and Roman is from Switzerland. And, and that's great. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some old work to start with, which really made us think about this new work and try to set up new models. Um, so this is one of these epithelial cell layers. This is the layer of cells like you've just seen. And we tried to map it onto a nematic. And to map it onto a nematic, I mean, the cells are circular, but, but they're stretched locally. Yep. And so you might imagine that at least um, transiently, you can give a direction to a cell. A cell is locally stretched, so you can put down the nematic director. And that's what we've done here. And what you see is topological defects. And this topological defect is moving like it's meant to. And so we said, OK, let's measure things. This is a while ago when we didn't know what we were doing. So we measured the velocity around this defect. We measured the stress field. And we compared the simulations with the experiments. And we were totally amazed by how good a fit it was. Um, so it seems like these systems have topological defects in them. Let me show you, uh, some of us went through this in the class yesterday, but let me show you another picture from that paper, which I think is cute. This is the number of defects in the layer as a function of time. So number of topological defects as a function of time. And what our experimental friends did is here, it, they, they, they sent the cells to sleep. They, they basically added blebistatin. And what blebistatin does, it acts as a sleeping pill for cells. So they stopped moving. They stopped being active. If they stop being active, the defects should anneal out, and no more should be created. And indeed, the number of defects goes down to here. Here, they washed out the blebistatin, cellular alarm clock, woke them up. And the number of defects increased again. And so these things are behaving like active pneumatics should behave. And uh, what the biologists were interested in, although I think this bit may be a little bit iffy, is that we found that the cells tended to die at the topological defects. And the reason for that is that these defects are positions of high stress. And the high stress drives a chemical called YAP from the nucleus to the cytoplasm, and that's known to kill cells. So it looks like the topological defects are preferential sites for the cells to die, but we'll leave that to the biologists. The data is messy, <laughs> mildly. OK, but, but what came out of this is questions, right? I mean, these cells are isotropic. They're round, on average. Why can round cells give me topological defects? Um, and then... You know, is it right to think of these things as an active system? Can we model them? How would we model these cells? We model them as a continuum, but it might be nice to have a system where you can actually see the individual cells a bit better. And so what I'm going to do now is um, just try and describe the model and then some of the more simple results we've got from this model. And... I'm going to describe a phase field model. Now, there's a poster out there. Where's, where's the young man with the poster? Who's, where, where's he gone? Um, him, there. Them, there. Right. These guys have done another model of cells, which is um, a bit different. Go and see their poster. 
And I think comparing the different models and trying to understand how they all fit together might help us understand what physics you really need in there to get a proper model of these cells. So this is my version. I'm not sure it's better than their version. Um, and, and, and then comparing them will be very, very nice, I think. Okay, so what this phase field model is, is that we have individual cells. So that's why it's different from the continuum. We have individual cells, and we put in forces so that they move. So we're going to end up with something which looks um, pretty much like this. These cells are going to start flocking. They're going to start all moving in the same direction. And those little red arrows are the velocity field. Now, about the next five slides is going to be maths, all right? This is, this is don't worry if you don't understand it. You're allowed to look at the pictures at the end. Um, but I'll try and explain what we're trying to do. Each of those cells is defined by what I call a phase field, which is one inside and zero outside. Okay? So I've got N cells. I have N of these phase field models. And this is the equations of motion for this phase field variable, which is one inside the cells and zero outside. The phase field is moved according to a velocity, and it relaxes to a minimum of the free energy. So we define a free energy for these things, and like everything else, things relax to the minimum of the free energy. But then these are active systems, so I also have to put on an active force which is proportional to the velocity because we're overdamped. So what I'm going to do is first of all describe what the free energy looks like, the passive forces on these systems, and then I'm going to describe the active forces, which are there specially because, um, because these, are, these are biological systems and they're active. Okay. So the passive forces, first of all, we have... Um, I mean, in a way, you've, you've either seen this as, as, as it is, and this is a very standard free energy, okay? It says that my variable is either equal to 1 inside the cell or 0 outside. And here's a term which says I have a surface tension associated with an interface. And then I have a constraint on the area, a soft constraint on the area, which says that the cells have to be a certain size, more or less. And then I have a repulsive term between the cells, which says these phase fields can't overlap too much. That makes sense, right? These cells are forming a layer, so they don't want to, over to interact with each other. And then I have a term here, which says that but they do like to stick together, so they like to adhere to each other. So we're guessing whether these are important, but it's the sensible thing to do. And then, of course, you have to see how much difference they make and compare it to the experiments. So up to now, what I've really got is a model of a bubble raft. Okay? If I just ran this thing, it would relax to a minimum of the free energy, and the minimum of the free energy would have a load of hexagonal cells sitting there, like bubbles. So now, how do we put in the active bits of the forces? Well, okay, I said there are two bits. First of all, there's a force which a single cell would insert, and I'm going to call that the polar force. Basically, it's a force which just acts on the cell. And then there are the intercellular, intercellular forces. And I believe that in the literature, these have not been sorted out in any of the experiments. And I think they're just sort of on the verge of people starting to try and sort them out. So let's start by thinking about this polar, well, I've got them here, the polar force, which is like a sort of single cell story. Single cells will go somewhere. And then these forces between the cells, okay, where they're pulling on each other. So let's start with this one. How do we put that one in? Well, what we do is we say the force is proportional to some sort of vector, which is the polarization. So the polarization is a vector associated with each cell. If you like, it's, it's the cell's sense of direction. And we haven't a clue how to put that in, but you can guess. 
might be sensible to take that polarization along the velocity of the cell, so it's in the direction the cell's moving, might be sensible to take it along the long axis of the cell, or it might be sensible just to make it random. And so we didn't know how to do it, so we're going to try all three and compare them. Because then if we see a difference, we can say, okay, so that's what's happening in the experiments. Um, okay, so this is how strong my force is, that alpha. And I have a time scale which aligns my polarization either with the velocity or with the long axis or has this thing moving at random so that the cell really does a random walk. What we found is that it really doesn't make any difference how we define this polarity, except that we see flocking if we align, if we, if we have the forces on the cell aligning with their velocity. Those of you that know about the V-check model of active matter Perhaps we should have expected that. I'll show you the pictures. Okay? This is hard, right? I think at this time of the day, we're not going to worry about the details. This is how we put in the intercellular forces, okay? It's a, and, 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 and what we do is we choose it so that if the cell's elongated, the surrounding cells tend to increase the elongation. They tend to take a cell and they tend to make it longer. This is a sort of sensible way of having the cells pulling on each other. And the reason that we do that is that a lot of equations later, it actually comes out exactly the same as that active term we put in the continuum equations of motion. But that's a bit hard, okay? So then we said, what happens to these cells? The two variables we concentrated on is a Coulomb here, the strength of that polar force, the force just the sort of single cell force, and up here, the strength of the intercellular force. And what we found is that in the blue dot regions, we got a state which looked jammed. The cells didn't move much relative to each other. It was a bit like a glass. That makes sense, right? Not many forces, nothing's pulling them anywhere. They just sort of stay put. And then up here we get a liquid. Unless for that special case where we have this force aligning to the velocity, so the force tends to encourage the velocity, then we get this extra um, thing here, which, is, which I call a flocking state, where all the cells move in the same direction. We'll look at pictures like that in a minute. Okay, so just to show you how the unjamming works, this is the center of the cells in the jam state and how the centers of the cells move in time and they don't go anywhere. Here's the center of the cells in the unjam state and they're obviously moving around. If we look at the number of rearrangements between cells, as we move from the jam state into the unjam state, so I'm moving along these lines, and I'm going to plot how the cells rearrange. Okay? In the jam state, they don't rearrange at all, and then as you go into the liquid state, they start rearranging. In the jam state, they don't rearrange. If you go into the liquid state, they start rearranging. That makes sense. What I found quite surprising is it doesn't really matter whether you do this by changing the intercellular forces or you do it by changing these polar forces. They just seem to do almost the same thing. These are the pictures of that actually happening. This is the li what the liquid state looks like. This is if it's driven just by forces between the cells, and this is if it's driven by... Um, these polar forces just pushing on each cell. These look a bit more elongated, but, you know, there's not very much difference. I thought that was quite surprising, but that's what comes out. Okay, so um, 
Just a quick comment is that this liquid phase looks very much like active turbulence. For example, we can see topological defects. And here's a correlation for you, Paolo. Okay, this is the vorticity-vorticity correlation, and it has this dip, which people who are looking at these correlations associated with active turbulence. So now let's think of the velocity. Let's just plot how fast these cells move as I change the strength of the intercellular forces. Okay, here, here's the glass where they don't move very fast at all and then they start moving faster when you have larger forces acting on them. That makes a lot of sense, right? Here, same thing, but now I'm changing the strength of these polar forces, the single cell forces. They move faster like that. So that makes sense. That's pretty obvious, really. So let me, the last thing I want to show you is, 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 is flocking. And, 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 and I'm now going back to experiments, all right? And I'm going to talk about two beautiful experiments which people don't understand. Um, and they're experiments to do with this flocking. So perhaps I should actually start by showing you what flocking is. Oh, I'm going the wrong way, sorry. These are the experiments we'll look at. This is when we slave the force to the velocity. So the forces we put on the cells are in the same direction as the, their velocity. And after a long time, you get flocking, where everything moves in pretty much the same direction. That, that you're getting laning to start with, where you get lanes formed, and then the lanes move around, and everything moves in the same direction, I hope. I meant to do that. Yep. Gradually, it's getting itself organized. And you get this flocking. So let's look at now two experiments where you get this sort of flocking behavior. Okay? So this is from a Milan group. This is ordinary cells, and what happens here is that you see the normal active turbulent-like velocity. Have we got this? Yes, this is on, the one on the left here. Okay? That's what we've seen before, normal active turbulence. Then what they did is they added RAB5A. They're not sure what this chemical does, but probably it mucks up the cell-cell junctions. It destroys the cell-cell junctions so the cells can't exert forces on each other. This picture is what happens to the velocity field when they destroy the cell-cell junctions. It's the one on the right here. You can see these cells just take off. So for some reason, if you destroy the cell-cell junctions or whatever this RAB5A does, which is probably that, the cells just suddenly start moving. They start flocking. They start moving all in the same direction. Here's the velocity as a function of time. These are the wild-type ones. These are the RAB5A ones. And just look at that difference, right? For biological data, that's amazing. Usually, you get at least most of the points overlapping each other. These things just suddenly move five times as fast. We don't really understand why. So that's the first experimental example. The second one is the egg chamber of Drosophila. This is a Drosophila egg chamber. The eggs grow inside it, and this egg chamber grows, and then the eggs inside it grow as well. And the egg chamber is lined with a layer of cells. And these cells start moving. They start moving round and round the egg chamber, just spontaneously. They start moving. Um, what am I actually seeing here? Oh, yeah, I think, yeah, you're seeing the chamber, and these are three marked cells, which is moving round and round the chamber. Nobody knows why. People think it's because of, um, as it goes round and round, it helps the chamber to expand into an ellipse. The um, biologists were looking for chemistry. You don't need chemistry. You can get this spontaneous flocking just from forces, but nobody quite knows why you get it. 
But what's gorgeous about the experiments is that they, they stop the flocking, they stop the motion by putting the cells to sleep, and then they start it again, and the cells move in the opposite direction. And then they stop them, and start it again, and they move backwards the other way. And they haven't a clue why that's happening. And I think that's just so cute. OK? <laughs> OK, so there's a nice problem for you. These are, these are just showing the flocking, showing the cells moving together. Best guess at the moment is that the flocking is a physics transition due to cooperative forces, but once the cells start moving together, they set up chemical interactions which reinforce the motion, but that's a guess. Okay, so we know how to get flocking in our model. Um, lots of experiments we don't understand, and I think that's probably a good time to stop. So that's my conclusions. These topological defects have biological relevance. Maybe only in small places, but they're still fun to look at. I think mechanics has a lot of biological relevance. We'd like to understand how to best model the forces on the cells. Okay? So that lovely poster, sorry, I've forgotten your name, but yeah, yours, your lovely poster. Um, if you can do the same sort of questions, it'd be nice to compare, because then you know what in the model might be important. Okay, thanks for listening. Okay, anyone? Yeah? basically the diffusion of the center of mass. It, it, I was doing it as the number of uh, rearrangements, the number of atoms which change their, sorry, the number of cells which change their nearest neighbors. But you could as well use the diffusion constant of the center of mass. Yeah. But it's different from yours, your experiments because we don't have cell division. All right? We don't have cell division here. It's the strength of the forces which are changing that transition. Not any change in density. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? There. Okay. Well, if people want to ask questions afterwards, that's fine. And uh, lunchtime. Hey guys, just before we go for lunch, let me make a few comments about the group representation that you have tomorrow. Uh, I guess everybody's a little bit curious. We already got some questions during the group section that we had this morning. So I'll try to explain in a very short way. Uh, I have it prepared like just by hand to speed up the time. The secretary is not to open it now. So you are going to see this piece of papers outside. In, in the title here, you have the group number, a keyword, and the number of the lectures. Just make a choice for the one that you feel that you, you have a better relation, you like more, you have your identity closer to your work, is the one that like to go, I mean, it's your choice. Choose one, you may have to choose just one, and, and then everybody that has been signing in the same group has to meet at some point, discuss, and prepare the presentations. Simple like that. I mean, you don't have it, if you, if you were trying three different groups, you don't have to prepare three presentations, it's just one, for the group that you, you think is more closer to you. Is that clear now? It's a simple thing. You have a 10 minutes presentation, and the idea is that you show what you have learned in a very, let's say, brief way uh, during these group sections. And especially, I me, mean, if you can make connections with the class, you can make connections with what we're reading in your PDFs. Uh, the PDFs are available. Uh, you can use the time of the study hours. You can use, use your other times. I mean, it's up to you when you're going to meet, how you're going to meet, how you're going to do the presentations. I also heard that people organize the group through the WhatsApp. Uh, it's fine, I mean. It's the best way that for you, I mean, that's going to work out for you, okay? So let's break for lunch and let's try to come back to try to follow the, the, the original schedule, okay? Thank you so much. <laughs>